I was reminded recently of um, how exacting sometimes the Bible can be in saying phrases. And I, I know you guys are just like me. You hear a phrase and you just kind of go, uh huh, yeah, and you just skip right past. We don't slow down and go, wait a minute, what does that mean? So I want to offer you a phrase this morning that should be very encouraging. Um, Lord, please open up the word to us. Uh, help us to find hope and comfort in it. In uh, Jesus' name, amen. And uh, it's interesting, you know, you, you turn to the Bible and you expect to be able to find the, the phrase right away and then you can't find it. Um, but here it is. Obedience of faith. This is found in Paul's introduction to the book of Romans. Now, um, I quite honestly skip past that phrase so many times, it's, it's silly. But what do you mean, the, the obedience of faith? I'm not sure what that means. I'm not sure what you're talking about here. And so, you know, since I'm a preacher, I'm kind of responsible to not skip past phrases, but to actually pay attention to them and, and figure out what they mean and, and explain those. Um, so here's Paul. He's preaching to a church that he did not plant. You know, Paul was one of the first missionary church planters to go to Gentiles. Anyone here Jewish background? Okay. All right. Good. That would mean all of us. All right. He, he, well, he's Native American. He's not, you know, you know, don't cut him some slack. <laughs> there you go. That's right. The skin doesn't come from Middle Eastern. It comes from South Africa. I'm South African. Ah! No, it comes from South Africa. North America. I was getting there. All right. <laughs> are, are you Creek or Cherokee? All right. Well, then it comes from right around here. So, yeah. But I would tell you, my ancestors came to America pretty early on. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and they married into the bird clan of the Cherokee Nation. That was back. Um, we were cousins to um, uh, what's her name? Everyone's famous princess. Pocahontas. Yeah, Pocahontas. Yeah. So just cousins. Not not in direct line or anything. Yeah. So there you go. All right. All right. Um, so Paul is is talking to people in Rome. In that church, there's most likely, because it's the capital of the empire, there's most likely different people from all sorts of ethnicities. For example, we know that there would be what we would call Africans in Rome as early as this point. Um, among some of the um, <clears throat> first deacons. The, the phrase Niger comes up, right? Which would have been Latin for dark-skinned. Mm -hmm. And um, that phrase then comes up among the elders in Acts chapter 13. And then a little later on in Roman history, we know uh, one of the emperors was clearly from North Africa, right? You can see his, his coins and everything. And you look at his name and you're like, yeah, yeah he's from Africa. And so Rome was very much like America, a melting pot all sorts of people from all sorts of different families and backgrounds. Um, my family background um, would have been recognized in Rome, but we would have been considered barbarians. In fact, the reality is that the barbarians that were nearest Rome would have considered my family, the barbarians no one wants to acknowledge. So, you know, it's like, all right, that's the way it goes. And so when he's preaching to the Gentiles, he's preaching to the church in Rome, He's giving them a message that's very, very important. And, and he's specifically explaining how he wants to come. There we go. He wants to come and, and, and preach to them in order to grow them in their faith and then <laughs> preach with them to the unbelievers around them and see them come to grow in faith. And he does get his wish. <laughs> Later on, he ends up going to Rome. He ends up in two imprisonments. And the last one, he ends up in Rome for, I think it's about seven years under what's called house arrest. And since he's a Roman citizen and he's appealed his case to the emperor, which was his right, he's got a trial, if not before the emperor, before the emperor's representatives. And it's fascinating, literally in some of the greetings and later letters, we see him reference, for example, some people with the name Claudia. Now, if, if you have the name Claudia, that would have been a last name, all right? It's like Moody, okay? If you have the name Moody, you know you're really big in the palate world, right? Okay, so the Claudians would have been those who were of the Emperor Caesar's family. Julius Caesar, Augustus Caesar. 
And so he's right there at the center of things, seven years under house arrest. Um, all of the Praetorian Guard, we're told, heard the gospel. And uh, Praetorian Guard's pretty important. Um, they become the emperor makers later on, um, even after this. And that's not good, all right? Uh, and he's witnessing like crazy. And so he's trying to achieve something called the obedience of faith. Now, my guess is that when you hear that word obey, or any of its versions, like obedience, you do the same thing I did. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. I mean, I got witness to in college. You admit you're a sinner. Okay, well, what's a sinner? Well, it's someone who hears God's Ten Commandments and goes, Okay, yeah, that's me. I don't I don't want to say that out loud, and, and I'll only say it with my friends who will laugh with me at my stupid jokes that really are blasphemy against the name of God. But I don't want to say that loud because I was raised in a Roman Catholic family, and you don't act like that, right? Okay, I, I know most of you guys were raised in families that someone somewhere insisted you be in church. And depending on how much authority, normally a she, had in your lives, you were in church more than just Christmas and Easter. I was raised to go to church Christmas, Easter, and Grandma's really going to get on you. Right? And so by the time I got to be a teenager, I figured out how to do this really well. We would go with our friends to the Christmas Eve service at the local church because that's where all the homeless people were, and most of them were drunks. Back then, most homeless people were just drunks, not drug addicts. And we would go to sit there in the back pew behind the homeless people and laugh at them. We weren't paying attention to was being said. And so I was raised with an understanding that to say you're a sinner just means to well, yeah, if, if, if the fifth commandment is this, then I've dishonored my parents. If, if the sixth commandment is this, according to Jesus, getting angry at even family members, well, then I've demonstrated i got a murderer's heart. If the seventh commandment is, is this, you, you lust after women, well, yeah, I'm, i got a really big lustful heart. If, if the um, eighth commandment is stealing, well, we won't go into that. I actually was a petty thief for a while. Um, if the ninth commandment is uh, telling lies about other people, my goodness, you know, if, if lies were electricity, I could run your air conditioner for the next 20 years. You know, it's just crazy. I mean, we're all like this. We're all condemned by that. When God's standard says, I'm so perfect, you got to meet my perfection. And if you fall in even one of these, you've demonstrated that you may not be as bad as the next guy, but you're his relative. And you're all going down. So that's what it means to admit you're a sinner. And I, my guess is, like me, most of us have said, yeah, I'm a sinner. And we haven't paid any attention to what it really means. And then when we say, now, ask Jesus to be your Savior, we get some mumbo-jumbo about he, he died on the cross and rose from the grave. I mean, that's about all we get. Oh, well, apparently he figured out how to beat death. Yeah, I want to be in a relationship with that guy. I want him to be my bud. I don't know what it means especially if he's going to save me from something called eternal hell. I'm, I'm not, I don't get it all. And so when we come across a phrase like obedience of faith, probably what we're hearing is, yeah, that's that stupid Christian requirement, say you're a sinner, say he's your savior. Now try real hard, do the best you can, hope for the best or else. And if you're like many of us, you know, if you go find a girl that insists on going to church, then you just go to her church and you play the game the way they play it. And you're a hypocrite. And no one's going to call you on it because everyone's playing the same game. In fact, that kind of describes the river region, doesn't it? That, that often describes Christianity in the deep south. We think obedience is, well, I do the best I can to keep God's laws according to my church's explanation of them. And I'm really not sure what all these words mean. And, but I've said the right words. And apparently if I say the right words, then I'm okay. Paul comes along and he uses some crazy phrase like obedience of faith. What in the world does he mean by that? Well, what he's not saying is he's not redefining these words in an odd sort of way. And he's turning faith into something it doesn't mean. He's not turning faith into earn your own way. See, that's the way we're all raised. We're all born with the idea of if it's going to be, it's up to me, do or die. I'll do the best I can, and somehow Jesus will take care of the rest. Meanwhile, the Bible says, no, you've got to be 100% perfect, and Jesus ain't going to do anything for you that you can do yourself. 
And then all of a sudden, other sins start to sting us in the butt. God would never ask me to do anything that I couldn't do. Well, if I could do it, why do I need a Savior? Worse, why is God going to ignore my hypocrisy for all the things that I could have done that I didn't want to, that I didn't care about, that I ignored, that I went to him about? So when Paul comes along and says obedience of faith, first we have to know he's not talking about faith in some foreign definition. He's talking about faith literally on the basis of what he said. Faith in Ephesians is a gift of God. It's not the result of anything you do so that no one can boast, even the tiniest bit. That's Ephesians 2, 9 and 10. And so he comes along and he gives us this faith. In, in John, we're told that that faith is actually the product of the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, John chapter 16, who comes and convicts us of sin, convinces us of judgment, and convinces us of the Savior. The three big things. He convinces me that God's standard is true and that I've violated it and I have no hope, save in someone else who pays the penalty for me and then provides me the obedience that I need. It's as if God says, you've racked up a debt. I've got some friends who spent years on the homeless circuit. You know, for them, it was crack cocaine that got them there. But they spent years in a homeless circuit. And one of them, right here in Montgomery, one of them, he had like $35,000 worth of debt in terms of parking fines and speeding tickets and interest added on top of those things. And 20 years ago, he lost his driver's license. And so now here he is, finally getting back on his feet, finally gets some help to get an apartment. Now he's got to go find a job. He's going to have to find a job that he can take the bus and spend hours. If you've ever been in the, I get to work by the bus, it's not fun. Or get friends to drive me. How often before your friends sit there and say, eh. Or you lie, cheat, and steal a little more, and you go drive a car you don't have a license for. He's like, I'm never going to get a driver's license, Reed. What do I do? It's a nightmare. And that's just for speeding tickets, right? Is he a bicycle? Not at his age and weight. <laughs> he ended up in the hospital. Yeah, all right. <laughs> so literally, in, in God's mercy, that got all fixed. He has a driver's license. He drives. Praise God for that. But my point is this. If that's what it's like for us with small time problems, how much worse is it for real when we stand before God on the judgment day? And he says, let's look at all your thoughts. Let's look at all your desires. Let's look at all your words, not the ones you said out loud and other people could hear you, but the ones you mumbled under your breath. Let's look at all those stray eye glances. Let's look at all those moments where mom or dad said, would you do something for me? And maybe they lost their temper and you responded back in your heart with anger. Let's look at all that stuff. Now, if I'm going to let you in, all that's got to be taken care of. Oh, and you have to have lived a life marked by perfect obedience. Every single time someone tempted you to sin, you chose to obey me inside and on the outside. Let's see that record because that's what God demands. I don't, I don't have that. Well, you need faith in someone who said, I'll do it for you. And that's what Jesus did in paying for our debts on the cross. God himself said, for all who will come to faith in Jesus, I will accept in their rebellion and the justice do them. Remember, God's got to be strictly just. You know, maybe an earthly judge can say, well, I like you, so I'll cut you some slack. But we know what kind of judge that is. You don't want to appear before that kind of judge. Because it's sooner or later going to bite you in the you-know-what. What we want is a strictly just God, and that is exactly what judge, and exactly that's kind of God he is. He's going to pay back every single thing. And yet he comes along and says, okay, I'll pay this person. And because he's both God and man, he can sustain the debt. The unquenchable judgment of God. Remember, infinite God, sin against him, infinite payment. Okay, that's the math. Jesus Infinite God can pay infinite debt. But more than that, he lived in a perfectly obedient life. When every, growing up, he had it. Hey, Jesus, all the girls, man, right? Okay? 
it, you know, hey, buddy, let's go. You know, they, they just they just crushed some grapes last night. And that, that wine's been sitting there overnight in the sun. It's going to get stronger today, maybe after work today. You know, go down to the, the local well and start talking to some of the loose girls who get their water when the other women are not there. You know, woman at the well, Samaritan woman. Let's let's go have some fun, buddy. Every single one of those temptations. And he didn't just go on the outside. No, no, I can't do that. He did on the inside. Why would I want to disobey my father in heaven? Oh, he understood all the temptations. He was tempted in every way as we are. Yet without sin, there was no sin on the inside of him. And so there was no sin on the outside. And so when he comes before God and he says, I'll pay for that person's debt, he also says, and I'll provide for their obedience, their record of obeying you, God. That's why Romans 5 says that we get out of Jesus righteousness. We get a right relationship with God that results in peace with God. Not the kind of peace the world offers. You know what kind of peace the world offers? Next time you have a friend die in tragic circumstances, and you're looking at him in the coffin, that's the peace the world offers. He's at peace now. He ain't moving anymore. That is not what Jesus offers. What Jesus offers is the flowering. I mean, every single dream and desire and hope we had in its most perfect form, no selfishness, no sin attached, all those things fulfilled for all eternity in ways that we can't even begin to imagine. Flourishing and flowering for all that. That's the kind of peace he offers. And that's the kind of faith that God gives birth to. He gives birth to a faith in us that we believe what God's word says about our sin and the deserving of the judgment. And then he gives us belief that Jesus really is that. Not just acknowledgement. Okay, that preacher, that makes sense. Okay, what are we going to do Friday night? (laughs) That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a faith that says, God, I want that. I want to be changed. If that's really the way it is, I want that in my life. Now, that's what he means by obedience. They came to Jesus after he fed the 5,000 on the mountainside. You know, two loaves, what is it? Five loaves, seven fish, right? 5,000 men fed, probably since women tend to congregate more than men, all right? Maybe 7,000 women, you know, at least half of them had some bambinos with them. So probably about 7,000 babies, right? He's upwards of what? 15, 20,000 people? Everyone getting their fill. Leftovers picked up in 12 baskets. So the next day afternoon, they hike all day. They, they try and get the, uh, the ships taken up across the Sea of Galilee. They finally get back to Capernaum. There's Jesus. How'd you get here so fast? You know, he doesn't explain to them that that night he walked on the water, got in the boat, and went back over with the disciples. Right? Doesn't explain that separate situation. But they say to him, okay, maybe you're the Messiah. Tell us what we've got to do to get bread from heaven like you gave us yesterday. In other words, tell us what we got to do to live in this eternal promised life that you have offered. What do we have to, if we could change the wording, what do we have to do to this? How do we have to obey God for him to then reward us with this result. Jesus understood what they're asking. This is the work you must do. Believe on the one whom the Father has sent. He doesn't say, believe the one whom the Father has sent. In in what he says, if you agree, it's true. He says, believe on, as in put your faith on him. So a little later on, okay, what job do they have you doing out there? The the stripping of the the pieces off the uh, broken pallets? A little bit of everything. A little bit of, oh, good place to start, okay? All right, Mario, is that right? Yeah. Got it. God, I'm trying to remember these names. Okay, uh, yeah, I remember the first time I saw him last week. <laughs> Covered with sweat. It was like, ah, oh, someone who knows how to work. <laughs> you guys, Jesus is not saying that's the work you got to do. What Jesus is saying is you've got to be changed into someone who really believes these things are true. And so when the boss comes up to you and says, let me show you how to do it, you trust that the boss is not going to show you how to cut your hand off. And you pay attention and you do what he says. Now, none of us can <laughs> have that kind of belief that we're sinners, that Jesus is the Savior, unless someone greater than us gives birth to it in our lives. This is what it means to be born again. 
It, it's not just language. It's not just some special ritual. Then you go get baptized by the tenth time. That's garbage. No, it's actually sitting down in, in the quietness of your own soul. Jesus, if this stuff is true, would you please convict me and convince me? Would you complete, watch this. Would you please put me on death row? And then put to death the old me. Don't, don't stop the hangman's noose. Don't stop the plunger. Don't stop the switch. Put that old me to death and then give me new life. Convince me, convict me in such a way that the old me dies and a new me is born right away. Oh, the wonderful thing is you'll never feel the burn of that spiritual poison coursing through your veins. You'll never feel the shock of the electricity racking your heart. You'll never fear the fibers wrapping around your neck and strangling the life out of you. God is merciful and gracious. In the same instant that he puts us to death in our old relationship with Satan, sin, and death, where we desire to do nothing but sit around the sewers of this world and swill on their margaritas. Instead, he immediately, when he saves us, puts that to death and brings to life a new person. Oh, I know the old body and soul are still here, all right? I mean, I'm not going into eternity looking like this. Well, I'll still have the bald head because we all know bald-headed guys are the most beautiful, right? So, is any, any, anyone in here catch up with me? Anyone? Jason? Of course. <laughs> I want to see the crown, baby. <laughs> you know, really oh, full of man, you do. Sir. So much for your Native American background. <laughs> so I'm kind of getting there. There we go. That's right. Great. <laughs> guys, this is what Paul means about the obedience of faith. He wanted to go to Rome to see them find hope in Jesus. Again, the, the obedience of faith, as we've described it, the obedience that kills the old life, the obedience that causes us to rise to new life, the obedience that longs to walk with him. Let me read you because he concludes his letter as well. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. In other words, he's talking about the change of their life on the outside. Watch this. That shows that they've been born again by a new faith on the inside. By the power of the signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem all the way around to Rulicum, that's basically saying from um, Mobile all the way over to Phoenix, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel. It is my ambition then to preach the gospel even more where it has not been named. And then at the very end, he says this. The Bible, all about the gospel, to bring about the obedience of faith. And he ends with this praise. To the only wise God, be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. So guys, we began by talking about phrases and words that we just skim over and we don't pay attention to, right? I hope I've given you some things to think about, about two of those words. When they're put together, produce an amazing result in our lives. We're called to the obedience of faith. We're called to be born again so that we don't have to fake and shake. We don't have to pretend. And how do we get there? Well, it's really simple. We can be nice to one another. No need for hypocrisy. Any of you are ever welcome any Sunday in our church. You don't have to pretend that you are what you're not. It's really simple. Right? And along the way, just take opportunities. Ask more questions. Right? I know Nolan is ready for more questions. Ask him more questions. You can ask Stephen. He'll sit there and go, uh, well, I've learned this. And, and then he'll dra drag you into something deep because he's an egghead. And then you can ship them back over to no one, okay? And don't worry, okay? If neither one of them are right or figure it out, Megan will be there going, helping them figure it out, okay? So um, some of you guys may have faith background. You know more than I do. I don't know. So I'm not trying to offer judgment on you. But if for any reason you're not sure, for any reason, you know, you're tired of listening to someone ask you to become a Christian, you know, well, I would challenge you to talk to Jesus about it. And just simply say, well, if disobedience faith is really that important, if it's really that valuable, if it's really the way to eternal life that's worth it, 
I want to believe that. Please change me. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, I know some of you are going, what about election? Well, you ain't going to do it for real unless you are among the elect. So I can say it, to say to you, just call on him. He will save you. Okay? All right. Thank you, guys. Let me pray. Lord, we praise you for your mercy and your kindness. And we pray that you would work in, in, in our hearts. Uh, cause us to want the obedience of faith and to grow it. In Christ's name.